Scottish Cup win was the fulfilment of a dream, the seed sown in a football mad family back in the 1950s. Very much so, yeah. My dad was uh, very keen on the football and the hearts as well. Uh, my brother was keen on football and, as I said, it was just uh, it was just really the community that I stayed in Wallaford, heavily football orientated down there and all the kids play. That I mean, in these days it's a lot different from now. And, you know, the jerseys down for the goalposts and that. And, and that's what, you know, everybody said that is missing nowadays. But uh, it was great. Everybody played it. And, you know, it was great to get back for school. Uh, get changed in a way down and 20 odd lads turned up and had a sort of wee kick about. So it was great. One particular time when, when uh, my sister was getting married and uh, her auntie, one of the aunties says to Jim, what are you going to be when you leave the school? He said, I'm going to be a professional football player. She said, who are you going to play for? I said, I'm going to play for the Hearts. <laughs> it was in this playground at Wallyford Primary School where the young Jim Jeffries began to perfect his football skills, and that was when his lifelong relationship with Billy Brown was first established. The primary schools in the, in the area used to play against each other, Wallyford and Billy was at Pinky, and there used to be great rivalry there between the two teams. Uh, they had a good side and uh, it was always a great battle, so that was where we first came across each other. But obviously when we went to grammar school, we were teammates then, and uh, were eventually teammates. And from there we've always uh, been very close friends. Back in the early days, it was Billy who was the better player. Well, probably, uh, probably I was at that time, yeah. I mean, I, I was captain of the, the school team and uh, I'd played for the county team in that at primary. And uh, yeah, it made it a wee bit easier for me to get in the A team when we went to the grammar. But uh, I think Jim missed the trials because he, he wasn't well and he, he got in the C team. And, uh, but he had scored a lot of goals, he was a striker at the time. And he uh, worked his way up and he uh, got promoted in to, uh, beside the big boys. It was around that time tragedy struck the Jeffreys household when Jim's eight-year-old sister Elaine was knocked down and died. Well, that's when my dad, mum and dad were very um, strong in that part because, you know, I was just a 14-year-old at school and uh, into the school team at the at the time. It was at Christmas time. It was a, a terrible thing because uh, my sister, my only sister, was my own my brother and and uh, she come back for a, a, a to go to a Christmas party and uh, she was at the age where she was, you know. Young girl liked the hair all done up for Christmas parties and everything. She came back and uh, she went down to the shop and she never returned and uh, it was a terrible time. Uh, she was hit with a she lasted something like three or four days in hospital and uh, I can remember how how it affected particularly my mum. I mean she had to be sedated for a, a good period of time. She was only eight year old, you know, and went for pipe cleaners for her hair, she'd sit spine here and she was going to a party. So I said, well, there's some money, go down and ask for pipe cleaners and we'll try them. Okay, well, my sister came over and done it and never came back. I think at the time, you know, I just wanted to forget all about football. That, that wasn't a concern then and it was my dad because I, I was in the school team at the time and my dad says, there's nothing I can do. And he just says, he encouraged me to get along to, to the football sessions and, you know, the... I remember Billy was being in the team and we were going into the Scottish uh, competition. We were doing really well. The, the, one of the competitions, rounds or getting nearer, I think it was a quarter final, was, was just a week ahead or something, the, the tragedy. And it looked like I was just going to, you know, not see it out. But uh, my dad said that there was nothing I could do and these things happened and he pushed me towards getting back in there and... Uh, and I did, so, you know, it, even though it was tragic, they were understood that these things happen in life and uh, you just have to get on with it. And uh, he knew how strong I was on the football side to, to say there's no point, they just have to get there and make sure that, um, you know, we, she would have wanted you to play anyway, he said, was a, was a, was a closing line, he says. She would have wanted you to be there and you've got to get through and do well for uh, the school and get to a final and that would have made her happy if she'd been alive, so uh, you just have to take that advice when you're that young, you know, because you really, when you're 14, you, you don't tend to take it all in. It would have been much worse for obviously mom and dad. Jim continued to progress as a player and was all set for a trial with Sheffield United. 
but the scouts who spotted him were given a job with Hearts, and the young Jeffries was soon heading for Tynecastle as well. Uh, the night they asked me to, to, to sign, I uh, played extremely well against the Scottish select, and uh, I think we won 5-1. It was a fantastic game. And they wouldn't let me get in the shower. I had to, you know, John Harvey pulled me in, and my dad and an uncle that was there at the time they signed me. Um, and when I went home, David White, who was the manager of Rangers, was sitting with my mum in the house, waiting till I get, got home, and one or two other clubs who were desperate to, to get to my signature after the game. Um, it must have been one of the good performances. I was actually <laughs> called into the next trial for the, for the Scottish team that we were playing against, so... Um, it was it was great. I mean, it, as I said, it, it, I didn't even think about going to any other club. Uh, the fact that I was in there and, and committed myself to the Hearts was fine because it was a club that if you support as a boy, you know, that, that, that was the first club you would pick and uh, I had no regrets about that whatsoever. A broken leg disrupted Jim's progress, but he was determined to make it and had a lot of support. John Cummins was a big influence uh, in, in terms of being at the, the, the Hearts and uh, he, you know, he had a, a great attitude towards training and, and being a winner and, uh, you know, I think I got on really well with him because I think he, he liked that type of player to, 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 to be there and, uh, and he was always encouraging there. And John Haggart, who I thought was a fantastic manager and, and uh, I got on really well with and he was a big influence in the in my career as well, so very lucky at the early age uh, with Hearts, you know. A spell with Gala Fairy Dean proved Jim had regained fitness, and in March 1972, he was given the news he'd always longed to hear. I think it was John Cummins who kept saying to Bobby Seath, you know, you, you know, we've got to give him a chance, he's been consistent. And uh, John tipped me off in the, in the Brown Gymnasium. He says, yeah, the gaffer's what to see you, and, and just gave me a wee wink, and I knew then that I had a chance of, of playing the next day. That was just fabulous to, to be told that. I just wanted to tell everybody, you know, back down to the primary school, to tell the local janitor who I was helping running the primary school team. I used to referee the games in the afternoons. He was the first person, of course, he took me, took me around all the classes that, that afternoon at the school. It was just great. And obviously, a very, very, uh, one of the greatest days to be in your life to be called in and told that you're going to play thinking that your chance had passed you by and after what I'd went through with a broken leg and that. So, uh, fortunately, I had a very, a very good debut. I mean, it was a hard game at you know, a tough place at East Fife. They were um, a tough match to have, but uh, played reasonably well and we came back from 2-0 and it ended up 2-2, so it was a, a reasonable uh, debut and just, just a great day. A striker in his school days, Jim had been turned into a fullback or defensive midfielder and won over the fans with his wholehearted approach to the game. I stood in the terracing and watched him every week. Um, he was an enthusiastic, occasionally over enthusiastic, uh, wing half. Um, Jim, I'm sure, wouldn't fall out with me if I said he wasn't the most skillful player that ever graced the turf at Tyne Castle. But what he was, is he was totally committed, he was a hearts man through and through, and he gave this club many, many years of good service. I have to say, he wasn't a, a player that was as memorable as many of them, he was a very good, solid professional. I don't think he would be offended by that comment, I think a lot of hearts are players. But what he did, what, did have was tremendous determination and uh, always gave 100%. I see him a couple of times, I was only a young, young lad at the time, I think my dad remembers him playing for the hearts, say, more as I do. He says that he was a good player, but I'd have to say that. <laughs> Jim was involved in three relegations and two promotions with Hearts. He admits there were hard times, but still looks back fondly on those years when he had the chance to play for the team he'd always supported. You're right, it was up and down. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to, to be there all the time under six or seven different managers and, and played a party. Probably played, obviously played a party going down, but played a party. He, um, he getting back up, particularly when I was captain one year, to, to, to get them up. But we had a lot of great games. It was great in the early years at Hearts. I think it was later in my career that it was starting to go up and down when, as, a, as a club financially struggled. But in the early part of the year, we were, we were quite a successful side and there were great times. I mean, 
uh, some really good players I've played with over the years. Jim played in just one cup final, the famous one, in which Hearts were 1-0 down to Rangers before 3 o'clock as the game kicked off early. Rangers were a good side. I mean, they'd won the treble that year and you know, to give them a goal there starting to the final, we had a, a real tough job in our hands. Uh, we, in fact, we, we steadied it a bit after losing a goal early and it wasn't just minutes before half-time that Alec McDonald hit it through a rookie players and Jim Cruikshank was unsighted. Um, so 2 0 down at half-time, we had a real mountain to climb and pushing forward to try and get back in the game, we got caught again. Greg allowing him to run straight towards the penalty area. Heading for the shot, this must be a goal! Graham Shaw, bold effort by Hearts at this stage, 3-1. We got a goal back and made it respectable, but uh, you know, we were well beat at the end of the day. But it was a great experience and uh, a very sad moment at the end when you can, you know, with your first final, when you see the other team going up to lift the cup because you dreamed all week of going up there and lifting it, but it wasn't it to be. But it does give you more determination to try and get back there. Jim had hoped for a coaching job, but in November 1981, after 349 games and six goals, he left Tynecastle. After a spell with Berwick Rangers, he rounded off his playing career back at Gala. Ditching plans to take over a pub, Jim was working his way up in the insurance business, when in 1985 he was finally persuaded to take over as manager of his local side, Lauder Amateurs. No, I started here, it was uh, a friend of mine who persistently tried to get me to help out at, uh, with the amateur team here, me being local and uh, a lot of the young lads, uh, obviously a lot of heart supporters as, as well. And, uh, you know, they'd struggled for a few years and just to come down and somebody get them right, well organised. And uh, some great times, clearing snow off the pitches and having to get the game on. And really it was just a matter of being into it for a few weeks and realised uh, how much I missed it and how great it was to, to just get a wee bit of involvement again. And uh, it, was, it was really smashing time. Never thinking for one minute what was to, to lie ahead, but uh, thoroughly enjoyable and, and great because you got real good commitment for the players and and really they were desperate to, to do well. Very limited, obviously, and uh, but they tried hard and that's all you can ask for. And they had a successful season, the first season, or well, the only season I had them in charge that um, we went from bottom of the league to a top four place. So uh, at least to, we managed to, to help them along the way. At the end of that season, Jim was approached by East of Scotland league side, Hoyek Royal Albert, to take over as their manager. <laughs> Oh, well, you would never believe the night I took over Hoyk. I mean, it was, I left Lauder with a few games to go. They were pretty, they were, in the, they were out all the cups, they were in a safe position. And it was, Hoyk asked me, they were ready to, to go from one division to the next. It was a split of the Premier League thing. And they said, 12, they're in 12th position. And when you walk in and say, this is a new manager, and half the team get up and walk out, you know, uh, and, and the deadline's 12 o'clock that night to sign players, and you've got a game on the Saturday. Phew, that, that was a, a, a tough start. So I had to use what... The only people I could sign were the amateurs. Now, coming from the playing in the amateur league, I got, you know, I used my what I thought was a good player from the other team and, and worked hard to get them in time to play on a Saturday. I mean, didn't even have a training session with them or nothing. It was just Casey phoning around the clubs and because it was a step up for them as well and a chance to play East to Scotland League, it wasn't too difficult but uh, we brought in about four or five players. Um, it turned out that the, the manager who was previous to me was a, was one of the local lads and it was all his mates that played and they felt sorry for him getting the sack and up and walked out and only five stayed so <laughs> so I managed to build a team in three days to go and play one of the the team's at the top of the league, but we, we got off to a great start with a 2-1 victory in Edinburgh and it just went on and we got them into a, a, a premier position where I think great performance, 12 games and we, we won eight, drew two and lost two and uh, that was enough to get them in the top half. And it looked like we were going to go in and have a good season next year until Gala Ferradine approached me and asked me to take over from the manager who had resigned at that time because it had been a long time then, David Watkins left and they were looking for a manager. We built a, a good side there, and uh, you know you need to for that for for that league, and uh, they were a big club, and uh, so we had a fantastic season, uh, three trophies in the one season, great run in the the Scottish Cup, um, 
Edinburgh City Cup. I think it was the first club in 26 years to, to win that. When you when you get through to to the to the final Easter Scotland Cup, which we won uh, ourselves in Whitehall Welfare, we'll then go through and represent Easter Scotland League against Berwick and Meadowbank, who were going for promotion to Premier League that year, and we beat them both. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, I mean, probably the lesser of the the three cups, but the one that gave me more. Uh, and when I was I was really delighted to win that uh, trophy more so than I mean the Scottish is a big one for everybody down there um, financially, but the City Cup had uh, just that wee bit special having beaten two senior sides to get it. Jim's success in the East of Scotland League had caught the attention of Berwick Rangers, then cast adrift as the worst team in Scotland. And in September 1988, he took over at Shalefield. The club had no money, so Jim didn't get a weekly wage. Instead, he was on £30 a point, and in those days, it was two points for a win. We didn't win a game for 10, 12 weeks, so it was very difficult times, but a lot of hard work had went into it behind the scenes. And... Uh, Again, I used the wee strength that when I went to, to, to East of Scotland League, I picked the best amateurs, and I did the same at senior level. They were better than what they had. Some of the, the, the East of Scotland players or semi-professional players at Hoyk and, and Galaferidine and Whitehill Welfare and teams that we see. And we, we brought them uh, to the club, uh, along with one or two other games and a couple of junior players, and managed to bring in some like 15 or 16 players. Then we just went off into. I mean, I remember we celebrated two, two weeks on the trot where we didn't lose, and there were two draws, uh, and one was four four, and one was three three. That back to back, hard times and, and difficult times, but um, we targeted to get the credibility back, and I think we did that. It was at Berwick that Jim joined forces once again with Billy Brown to form what has become an enduring partnership. It is, yeah. It, when, when Jim went there, uh, with Lindsay Muir there. Lindsay was actually assistant, but J Lindsay was playing as well, and, uh, and they obviously needed somebody else, you know, to help out on a Saturday and at the training. And uh, you know, Jim asked me to come, and that's where we teamed up. Life was a struggle at Berwick, but between them, Jim and Billy Brown transformed the team. We sort of decided to adopt the the Wimbledon method, and uh, we put Big John Hughes up, Big Yogi up front. He was a centre half; he'd never played up there before. We put him up front. And we used to just knock long balls in, and uh, we went 21 games without defeat. We got beaten our 22nd game at Albion Rovers in the last game of the season. So we turned the whole thing round, but just to give you an example how far behind they were, after that 21 game unbeaten run, we still finished second bottom of the second division, or the third division as it was at the time. <laughs> You know, so <laughs> things were bleak, but really uh, we, we got it going and, and the place was buzzing, you know, and the, the results were good. George Deans and Wilson Young sold out at Berwick Rangers and took over at Falkirk. A short time later, after a bizarre period in which he was both manager and chairman of Berwick, Jim followed them to Brockville. David Holmes was running the club and the new management got off to a dreadful start. It was David Holmes who pulled me into the office and said, well, what do you think? Because it was starting to get to, to the, the real crucial stage now, because he had told them we were going to do something they'd never done before in their history, and that was win the championship. I mean, they'd only been promoted as runners, runners up, and then suddenly I'm the manager who's, if you know David Holmes, and he tells you or tells them that he's going to do something, he is going to make sure it, it happens. And uh, so he asked me, and I said, well, I said, I think this team will get you more chance of being relegated than than uh, promotion or winning the championship because I was told before I got the job that there were a great set of players and they just needed uh, handled and, and maybe with one or two additions uh, but again I cleared I got my own people in and uh, had to sell their best players for less than what people had valued them at but started to get the change going and built my own side there the side that Jim built twice won the First Division Championship and also the B&Q Cup. Even when they were relegated, they were applauded for their attractive style of play. One game towards the end of that season was to have a huge impact on the future of Hearts. In a stunning match at Brockville, Joe Jordan's reign as Hearts boss was ended by a 6-0 Falkirk victory.
Mm, I'd been tinkering around uh, putting in the odd letter through advisors to Wallace Mercer in those days, but the 6 0 defeat decided that um, there would be something a bit more serious than that. And uh, of course, it was only a, a matter of weeks before, uh, after that, that uh, Wallace Mercer had his famous Amsterdam press conference and announced that the club was for sale. I just, I think it was just one of those days when everything, everything went right for for Falkirk. You know, we were, at that stage we were looking, we were looking like we were getting relegated, and we had, I think it was two or three games left in the season, and we really had to win all our games. So we come out, we played Hearts, and we were, you know, we really needed to win the game, and we did, and everything seemed to go right. You know, there was goals, there was goals going in left, right, and centre. I think I even scored one. Chris uh, says to me since then that the day that we beat them six 0 at Brockville. He made the term or, or gave himself a commitment that he was going to, uh, you know, buy hearts. I know, I know, it took some time, but to, to come through. But uh, he'd seen enough. I think uh, we finished the, the Wallace Mercer era, and uh, it, it it came through. Uh, but he chose, and I can see the reasons why they chose a, an experienced manager. They, they hadn't a lot of experience in running a football club, Les Deans and, and Chris Robinson, and so you couldn't really blame them for going for somebody with experience, uh, or more experience, should I say, than, than myself. And uh, But I just worked away and said, well, if it doesn't work out, you know, I hope to try and be in the frame. And the only way I could do that was keep being successful at Falkirk, which I was. No, he was very much a candidate whose name was in the frame. Um, we decided that, um, that it's a big risk getting involved in football. It was an even bigger risk getting involved in hearts, I can tell you, at that time. And um, to balance the risk, we felt that we needed a manager with some experience, and hence the, the, the change that we made at that time. And um, it, was a, it, it was the fact that Tommy was readily available and um, hadn't re-signed a contract at Motherwell that swung the balance in favour of Tommy McLean. Twelve months later, Hearts were again looking for a manager. This time there was only one choice, but the appointment could hardly have been more controversial. Oh, I probably have to say the worst time in your career. That, I mean, not for the fact that it was a very, very tough decision because you, your heart's always wanted to... I mean, it was always wanted to be Hearts. I mean, that, that's what's the strange part about it, is that you always wanted to be manager of Hearts. Um, but you've got another side of it. Football's such a precarious job, and the five great years at Falkirk, I, people say, you know, I treated Falkirk badly. I, I tend to think that's the biggest compliment I could play, pay them, that he was a Hearts player, supporter, um, you know, desperate to, to, to manage Hearts one day, and I took that long to even think about it. And, and that was because of the rapport I had with the people in Falkirk, and the, the way the club was, and the way that the, the, they were progressing and big plans ahead and I felt one part of me wanted to to be part of that or help them towards that because I knew what it meant to so many people. It was just just a great place to be and for, for such a small club. To be honest, I thought he would go. I didn't I didn't really think there was any doubt that he was going to go because I knew he was a Hearts man and knew he played for Hearts for a long time and, and deep down he was a Hearts supporter. I think you know at the time Hearts, Hearts was a good move for him because you know they were they were struggling a little bit and I don't think there was any doubt that he would turn them around. But I think you know his loyalty to Falkirk and what you know they'd gave him an opportunity and they'd done well for them and he, I think he'd got a good bond with the the supporters in the town as well. It was probably you know it was it was pulling him to, to stay there. I think he always wanted to come to the Hearts, but I think he felt a real emotional hold at Falkirk that. that you know, we were probably built so much there that it was hard just to say, well, I'm leaving now and, you know, everything I've said, you, you know, about pulling together, you know, is, is finished with. But, uh, you know, it was a difficult time and, and I think maybe Falk had tried to play on the emotional side of the thing. And it happened in a flash. I, I, I had enough of it. I just said, ah, well, if it's going to mean this cause that much trouble, I'm better to stay. And suddenly I was whipped out in front of the cameras to say, and thankfully people noticed that it wasn't just me, like a, a zombie, if you like, realised what I've done here, you know, and uh, when I got back, Chris Robinson couldn't believe it, he says, I says, can't believe it myself, and that's when it all started, he says, well, what happened, and I told him the whole story, he says, seems to me you still want to be manager of hearts, I says, well, I can't now, I've, and he says, do you want to be, I says, yeah, he says, well, we need to meet. There was a, a few difficult days, even then, you know, when, um, when George Wilson at Falkirk was finding it hard to give up and uh, 
uh, let Jim go and claiming compensation and uh, contractual things. But we got there, and uh, the press conference uh, was um, a, a good moment for us, uh, that Jim had come back to Hearts. It quickly became apparent to Jim that big changes were needed at Tynecastle, and he began the painstaking task of revitalising the playing staff. No disrespect to the players that were here before, I mean, they all did a terrific job for Hearts, but I think uh, the gaffer came in and he knew that he had to bring in the new faces and he brought in, as I say, a lot of the youngsters, some of the foreigners and uh, he made some cracking signings. He uh, likes Colin Cameron, Steve Foote and David Weir, Big Cammy, Neil McCann, he brought all these guys in and uh, I think now uh, the fans are seeing the true hearts were up there sort of challenging Rangers and Celtic and uh, long may that continue. But that looked some way off in the autumn of 1995 even though there was the satisfaction of an early home win over Falkirk. Good running into space for Cahoon. This should be the second, it is! Going outside McLaughlin. Cahoon's header! It's a great goal for Hearts! With John Robinson. But by the next time the sides met, Hearts were struggling and were beaten 2 0 at Brockville. That is the day, that was the day I, I, I let rip into the dressing room and told them exactly what was going to happen at Hearts. And I don't care if it doesn't go wrong, if it goes wrong, I say, I've, the, the Hearts people have put up with this enough. I've seen it now after nine games, occasional good performance. The euphoria is over now. Me coming in, it was then to make the tough decision. Young boys would be given a chance, and not just in for one game, in for for a good run at the team. And if it didn't work out, I'd lost nothing. Because I think people would have to say, well, at least he's trying to do something to get it going the right way. Among the changes, Gary Locke was made captain. New signings arrived, and youth was given its fling. He's brought in the, the aspect, if you're uh, young enough, you're good enough. I think the number of players whose careers were going stale at Tynecastle before he arrived, and they've gave, he gave myself a, a great injection. He, he gave me my debut at 19, where I'd been here since I was left school at 16. So I waited about a while, and once he came, I was absolutely delighted. The form picked up, and in November 95, Jim Jeffries enjoyed his first win over city rivals Hibernian as Hearts manager. That's awkward. Comes Robertson. No answer to that. The power was too much for Leighton. He's got a real lift when you beat uh, his closest rivals, and we know how much it means to the supporters. So, you know, being a supporter myself and one or two of the players, Gary Locke, and that was, it was fantastic. And uh, obviously, when the derbies come in, they just, they just take on that wee bit extra. So it was nice to get off the a start right in the first game. In January 96, Hearts pulled off their best win of the season. Alan Johnston scored a hat-trick in a stunning 3-0 victory at Ibrox. It was a fantastic, I mean, a great record through there, particularly the last few years. So to go there and win 3 nothing, I did say after the game that uh, Rangers got off lightly at 3-0 because we felt we had a couple of other good chances, but I actually remembered the uh, actually not says to me after the game, says, I heard you on the television and he says, you forget we didn't say much when we beat you three there before. <laughs> so you learn uh, not to say too much, even though you've got a, a couple of results. And uh, no, it was great. It was great. The supporters loved it. It was a great performance. And Sticky's individual performance was, uh, as he gets uh, the nickname Magic, and it was certainly magic on the day. Ever since losing out in the 1976 Scottish Cup final, Jim had been desperate to make amends and he began to sense he might get the chance when Hearts reached the 96 semi-final, where they faced Aberdeen. This barrier of getting over a semi-final, I think Hearts had been favourites over the last few years. Strong favourites of getting through to a final. I think they played Airdrie twice, uh, St Mirren, um, and Hearts would be looking to be in finals. And, and the fact that you've deprived even the player, the supporters a great day out, uh, whether in an opportunity to go in and, and get a trophy after all the years of waiting was something that had to be overcome first before we won a cup. That's 
Poynton's corner. There's Dave McPherson's header! Cleared by Michael Watt! And it's there! John Robertson has scored! John Robertson doing what he's best at when the scraps are around, he'll happily take them. It wasn't going too well, but um, we got the first goal and uh, we held on for a wee while and suddenly uh, Aberdeen did what other teams have done to Hearts in the past. And, uh, you know, coming down if they've got the bottle and uh, I think for the last 10 minutes I've been equalised but fortunately just on injury or just on time uh, the cross came in and Alan Johnson got the header and that was just a fantastic feeling uh, as big a feeling as beating the Hibs in, in the first game because um, we put, give the supporters that big day they were looking forward to and we'd overcome a, a, a barrier to uh, getting into the final so that was a big game for us and one that pleased us uh, enormously. Johnston's in the middle, there is Johnston's header! Alan Johnston has scored for Hearts. And this match takes another amazing twist. The cross from Robertson and Alan Johnston was there, the powerful downward header and it squeezed its way under Michael Watt. Hearts hadn't won the Cup in 40 years, and Jim hoped to make history in his first season in charge. But it turned out to be a desperately disappointing day in the final against Rangers. We beat Rangers twice that year in the league, and everybody thought we were in a real chance. Um, you know, I think it worked against us. I think there was a lot made of the fact that we beat them twice, and everybody, it certainly fired Rangers up. And Rangers, when it comes to finals, with the quality players they have and the, and, and the way they were playing at the time as well, was always going to be difficult, and uh, we got a couple of half chances. I think Gordon brought for a good save from Alan Lawrence, but when the first goal went in, uh, it was always going to be difficult. Then when you've got Loudrop and Jury and Gascoigne hitting you in the break, they were just phenomenal, uh, and, and we got well, well beat. But uh, we learned a lot of lessons that day, and you have to do that in, in defeat. It was a, a sad day, but uh, one that we wanted to get back there as quick as possible to get it out of their minds. And that chance came six months later, when the sides battled through to reach the Coca-Cola Cup final. Walter paid us a compliment. He said to me that he realised Hearts would have a good challenge last year in the league based on that performance, because after, in May, getting beat 5-1 and then having to play them so quickly um, would be a measure, you know, especially when we lost two goals in the first 20 minutes, then you're, you're saying to yourself, well, here we go again. But he, he realised the spirit and, and the lessons that the, the club learned from that, that defeat in May had certainly been tested. And uh, we came through it, I think, with flying colours, even though we lost a fantastic match. I felt it 2 2. They got away with it, and from that, Gascoigne produced 15 minutes of, of magic. And uh, we came back strong again. And OK, it was too late for when David scored, but I felt that uh, we'd come a long way. It proved to us how much we had just come from that day in May and uh, we said that if we could show the same improvement on the next time, we would win. It's that sort of determination and will to win that has been the hallmark of Jim's relationship with Billy Brown. It's a partnership which has become one of the most formidable in the game. We thought maybe that it wouldn't happen and uh, for it to work out as well as it has done uh, is remarkable. And, you know, you sometimes ask yourself why, because I mean, we, we have been successful everywhere we've been. Obviously, we've got something that, 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 that works, and uh, I just hope that it continues. I think, personally, that you need to have the two of them. They complement each other. Um, Billy takes a lot of the training, and the gaffer just takes a back seat and gets his wee bit neb in here and there just to wind the boys up. But I think they work excellent as a partnership, and I, I don't think Hearts would have the success without the two of them as it is. They just complement each other uh, really well. Well, I, th I think they always have. Uh, a lot of people say the gaffers look lucky and things like that, but you know, I, d I don't think that's that's all that true. I think he's probably got a wee bit of luck, but you know, you've got to have a certain degree of skill in your job and things like that to let like, turn hearts around. You know, he's, I think the, the supporters will you know, always be kind of lazy to them. But it's a great partnership. It's been a proven success over the past uh, whenever they started management together. Um, they, they work very well together. Billy is the one that tends to do the majority of the talking, and Jim's a sort of deep thinker in the background. But Jim will come in and say his piece when, he, when it's required. I mean, it's not as if uh, 
we agree all the time because we don't. You know, we debate everything. But uh, you know, whatever the, the final decision is, you know, we we'll always just get on with it. And uh, I mean, why it works, I don't know. I'm not going to look too deep into it, but it does work. And, uh, you know, also we're friends as well, I think. Between him and Billy, there's a, there's a perfect balance here. Uh, the manager really takes a back step before the game. It's mainly Billy Brown that does the, the team talking that, and the gaffer just sit back and sit, uh, sets up the, the set pieces and stuff like that. And then it's during the match where he comes to life. He play a bad pass, you see, the two of them jumping up and shouting at you, but I think most footballers just sling their manager a defeat when they're in that situation. It's all right when they're shouting nice things, you'll listen to them then. But uh, I think that's just the way the gap on that are, you know what I mean? Like, he's been a heart supporter, hearts player and things like that. Now he's hearts manager. Uh, they just get a wee bit wound up, standing at the side. It's just when you see the, the veins coming out in the neck and that. One fixture always guaranteed to set the pulses racing is the Edinburgh Derby. And in Jim's second season as Hearts boss, his success rate continued. Two of the best performances of as a manager. I think um, we started the game really well. Hunton. He gets a bring of the ball through for Robertson. Cameron! Oh, wonderful goal! Colin Cameron with 19 minutes gone, a superb strike. Jim Layton hitting an athlete. That's uh, Miller who gets back and Layton's giving it away. Oh my goodness, Jim Layton, what a blunder. And Colin Cameron eagerly accepts the gift with 29 minutes gone. Cameron's second goal of the game, misery for Jim Layton. Jackson. Again, Bickford's deep in his own half, gets it away. Here's McCann, showing good pace again. The chance is on for Roberts and he must score! Another milestone in the marvellous career of this little man. It's his 25th goal against Hibernian. It's his 250th goal for Hearts. He's absolutely delighted. It was a great first half performance and we came in and, OK, it was about being professional. The Hibs did get back into it with a penalty, but uh, it was a great win and, and you know, especially when you go down there again at Easter Road. And then on to the Jim Duffy's four game, uh, first game. I mean, that was a performance where we could have scored a lot more goals and uh, for nothing. It was a, a tremendous first half display again. Um, so nice when you, as you say, you can go there and it's a great feeling, you know, five minutes for the end when you're up 4 0 and uh, you know the game's practically <laughs> guaranteed to be success. Uh, you get success. So you just wish it would go in that wee bit five minutes longer, but it's, it's, um, it's always nice. And I'm sure it would be the same if, if it were in that position, but. Uh, Great performances and the fans uh, always look forward to a good victory over their rivals. There's no such thing as a normal day in the life of the Hearts manager. This is a look behind the scenes one Tuesday in October. They won't give any secrets away here. Or, you know, we've got a trial. Uh, Hello. Hello. Hey, what else did we say? Yeah. Oh, 
camera is always good. It's like a disco in there. There's not much meal for you today. I'll be happy to know. What about the stuff I gave you yesterday? Hi. It's Jim. How are you doing? All right. Listen, um, half past 11, I need him here for. The medical's at 12. Okay, and I've, if everything goes all right, then hopefully I'll have the press conference at 1 30. Jim McArthur has just phoned, just phoned up to confirm that the talks we've had have, uh, are very interested. We'll confirm in the morning that everything's okay and uh, he'll be here at 11.30 for medical for Alan to take him up for 12 and I hope that if uh, we get the word in the morning then we'll have the press conference at half past one. Good. 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 Well, he's the one that we've looking for to... Scores goals. So, uh, you know, the front three's been doing well, but they've had to share it since we... It's a wee option, what they've got. A wee option up front, then. Somebody can head it in. Can head it in, you can go over the top as well, so... Well, that's the fact it's... Oh, here we go, here we go! Peter's wife, didn't he? Is that a coffee for you? Turn the camera off. It's the wife. Ah. Will you bring in a loaf?
Home for Jim, his wife Linda, and their children, Louise and Callum, is the sleepy borders town of Lauder. I mean, it's difficult for a house manager or a house manager in Edinburgh to, to have any sort of uh, life at all, but, um, you know, it's great. I've been staying here since 72, and it's about a 45-minute journey out. To, and there's a lot you get a chance to gather your thoughts and, and prepare things and, and think about things. Uh, and the great thing about coming here is that everybody's accepted you as who you are and not just because you're the Hearts manager, you don't get pestered with, you know, uh, what you should do and what you shouldn't do all the time. Quite simply, when you meet up socially you, or anybody during the day, they, they just ask how things are going and, and it lasts a few minutes and then you're treated like any other person that's part of the, the town. So it has uh, great advantages that way. and. As I say, nice, relaxing, peaceful. Uh, we don't get many opportunities in, in football to, to do that, but uh, certainly out here, uh, it just is a wee chance to get away, away from it all. When he does get the chance to relax, golf is Jim's other great passion. He's been club champion at Lauder on 10 separate occasions. Well, it's a favourite pastime when I get the opportunity. Obviously, that's not as much as it used to be, but. Um, Nice to get back and on a, mostly on a Sunday, Sunday morning, like to come up to Ladder and uh, play around. And this is typical conditions for uh, medal rounds you play up here because it uh, can be a very tough uh, nine hole golf course. Yeah, I think most footballers uh, are very keen at, when I was a footballer that uh, the time we did have spare, we spent a lot of it on the golf course. And uh, I managed over the years to keep a single figure handicap. Uh, I don't know why I'm at at the moment because uh, I think that's just because I don't play in the competitions now because I've not got the time but a few times I've managed to get around I've, I've been there or thereabouts uh, but as I say it's uh, the best way I like to relax and sometimes when I'm striking the ball uh, on a Sunday morning I think of some people that's unpopular with me and managed to hit it a few hundred yards down the fairway. <laughs> at the start of Jim's third season in charge at Tynecastle he knew the expectations of the Hearts fans had grown Having gone close on two occasions, it was time for the club to start winning things again. We always wanted to progress. I said that it couldn't happen overnight, and we wanted to progress. And uh, you know, from going in the bottom before I went there, I said the last two games of the season at the wrong end of the table to fight relegation. Suddenly, we went a couple of years uh, of um, being in the top four. Disappointed to miss out in Europe the second year after making it the first year. Um, but that was our own fault. We relied, we, th we thought in the semi-final that Kilmarnock and, or Dundee United and Celtic would get through and that we'd get it through their league position, but uh, the lesson there is that you don't rely on anybody else, you, you do it yourself. And we made that point to the players uh, after we missed out in Europe. So going into the new season, we knew that we had to do better than we've been doing and uh, because we probably consolidated that second season of being in the top, top four. Um, as I say, we made another cup final with the Coca-Cola Cup final. So it was now, I think, time that we, we showed that if there was going to be improvement. And we brought a couple of players in and uh, and I think we just then, we got off to a reasonable start. And then a wee period just after the start, we, we started to hit teams with two or three outstanding performances. That we, just, we just couldn't play against us in the first half hour of matches and we were winning games and the confidence grew. Suddenly we went on a wee run and suddenly we were at the top of the league and... People were saying, well, it'll never last and blah, blah, and firing us up. And uh, they kept trying to get us to admit that we, we were serious challengers. But we talked about it a lot at the club that we would be, but we never said very much. And uh, we just said we'd do all the talking on the pitch. Cameron. Ball breaks for him. This could be another one here. Cameron. Oh, great saving challenge there. Well, this game almost turned in its head. The fans still roaring, hearts on. Good ball three for Fulton! It was on the 20th of September that Hearts hit the top for the first time that season. 
John Robertson scored the winner against Dundee United. Stefan Adam, it's a good ball too from Poynton. Away from Brian Martin, squares it to Colin Kirkman. Six minutes gone, and Hearts are in front. We are for Hamilton. Denham missed his kick. And onside is Stefan Adam, great chance for number two. And a great piece of finishing from the Frenchman. Weir. That's for Hamilton. He's got time. Knocks it down and Neil McCann scores. Number three for Hearts. They're running away with this. It's well done, Faulkner. He finds Valakari. One back by Camera. Break on here for Hearts. Fulton alongside him. And this is Jim Hamilton. A chance for Hamilton. Number four for Hearts. As the winning run continued, there was another victory over Hibernian for the Hearts fans to savour. John Robertson, who else, scored the opening goal. And substitute Jose Katongo weaved his own brand of magic to clinch the three points. One game that epitomised Jim Jeffrey's love for the club was against Celtic at a crucial part of the season. Hearts were trailing 1-0 late in the match. The Celtic game here was uh, one that I can remember. I've seen it in the telly and we scored the goal. I think he was standing uh, further on the part than I was, but it just shows you how much the club means to him. And it's a bit similar to myself and his heart staffed and he just wants to the, the best for the club. And we're all the same here and I think his emotions that day showed that. Well, the supporters came up in here. And we knew it was a big game because we we'd stayed away the night before and we got the result through from uh, that Dunfermline had equalised in the last minute at Ibrox. So I know this was a, a really big game and Celtic probably knew that they could be heading back up the M8 top of the league, the top top of Rangers, and that's and the the they were better on us on the day. They did they did have chances to kill us off, but when Katongo scored. Well, oh, that was just, I mean, it looked all over and then playing injury time. And I knew even a draw that day would keep us, you know, that would just make it everything as before. So I just run towards um, Paul Ritchie, was the one that asked and He just, he started going towards me. And of course, I realised I was 20 yards on the pitch before I thought I shouldn't be here. And I turned and got, got myself back to the to the dugout as quick as possible. And uh, But that was the supporter side of me. That's, I think... One of the things, if the manager shows the same enthusiasm, but there's nothing better for the manager than his team scoring. Nothing worse when the team lose a goal. Uh, so, hopefully, we, you know, uh, I wouldn't mind doing two more runs in the patch for big games like that. The league challenge finally faltered just a few matches from the end of the season, but the cup run went all the way. Thomas Flogel scored the first against Clyde Bank, and from another free kick, David Weir sealed the victory. Jose Katongo was on target in the fourth round against Albion Rovers. Colin Cameron made it two from the penalty spot. And Katongo scored his second late in the game. to know this could be very dangerous indeed. Steve Fulton so precise normally with a left foot. It's got to Hamilton at the far post. Takes his time, takes the deflection. Finn Bogson knocks it away. And eventually whacked out by Derek Anderson only to Cameron. Now the chance for Paul Ritchie. And Ritchie has hammered that one into the roof of the net. Hearts won their lap after eight minutes. Lee Smith, good cross again! 
2-0 for Hearts. Thomas Vogel with a header. He's not that one past trainer, giving himself a lot to do. He gets there. It's a decent cross. Vogel knocks it back. Hamilton battling away there. The ball wouldn't come free, but it does for Steve Fulton. And Hearts score 3-1 ahead. Good play. Fulton has the opening. He finds Grant Murray. He's well headed away by Trainer, only as far as Gary Locke. And it almost caused, and but it has caused a real problem for Finn Ferguson. And Jim Hamilton has pushed Hearts 4 1 ahead. And that set up a semi final clash, ironically, against Falkirk. And it was a game I was always concerned about because Falkirk. The rivalry between, obviously, of, of the situation with a lot of players that we knew who were capable of doing, putting in good performances, they'd gain masses of confidence for the Celtic, knocking Celtic out the, the year before. So they knew that, you know, if they were prepared to go in there and beat Celtic over two games, they, the Hearts weren't going, you know, weren't going to frighten them. And uh, they knew that on the day, anybody's capable of beating anybody. So, um, but we got off to a great start. And, and you know we didn't. But Falkirk didn't lie down, and uh, I think the pressure was all on Hearts and none on Falkirk. It's well judged by Jim Hamilton, and in from Stefan Adam. Five minutes gone. It's a dream start for Hearts. And I still thought if we got a second goal, we'd kill him off. But Kevin McAllister, who was rightly man of the match, I mean, scored just an unbelievable goal. And I would have settled for 1 1 at a time. I think the whole team, if they were honest, would have settled for 1 1 because they were definitely a team with 10 minutes to go. I mean, I looked up and it said 80 minutes, and I was hoping it would be 80, 89. But uh, the one thing we have shown a lot in the last couple of years is the character. I mean, you've got people like McCann, and, uh, who wasn't having, who was having a quiet game, but he's liable at any time to, to win you the match. And I think uh, the pace and movement of Adam and McCann in the last 10 minutes definitely got us through to the final. Adam, good reverse pass for Neil McCann. McCann in behind Neil Burney. And Neil McCann! And it's Stefan Adam! Right on 90 minutes! And the Frenchman wins hearts a place in the final. David Weir's header. Neil McCann, he's away from Neil Berry. Neil McCann has just for number three for Hearts, he's done it! And now the Hearts fans can celebrate. That's 3-1. It was Jim's third final as Hearts manager. Again, Rangers with the opposition, and that made victory all the sweeter. No doubt about that. I mean, if you'd give me one team to, if we were going to win it, Rangers was the team we were wanting. But again, it was down to looking at what we'd done against them in the season, telling the players, and the, it started right away on this on this Monday when we got to the training ground down at Stratford. We said that the way that we play must suit Rangers. They scored 13 goals against us in the league. We haven't beaten them, and we have to change it, because if we don't, we're going to end up giving them two or three goals, because I think, even though we've had other plaudits and we like playing that way, if we're wanting to seriously win the cup, it doesn't matter what performance is out there. I don't care if all the statistics prove that Rangers are the better side and have more corners than that. If we want to win the game, we have to do things differently. And we did, and we worked hard to do that, and the players carried it out to, to tea, getting the penalty. And everything. It was just meant our game plan was made now. So the 113th Scottish Cup final is underway. And Paul Ritchie, one of the survivors of the team on the wrong end of that 5-1 scoreline. And there's Gary Naismith, a player who really has established himself well in the Hearts team this season, looking for and finding Stefan Adam. Steve Fulton. And he's made a distinctive break, and it's a penalty! Would you believe it? 30 seconds gone. Fulton's weaving run brought the challenge, which Willie Young thought was an offence, and he's pointed to the penalty spot, and what a dramatic start here. 
And now, more than ever, Rangers will be relying on the experience of Andy Gorham, who's never been beaten in his previous Scottish Cup appearances. But he's been beaten for the first goal of the game, and it's Cameron who's given Hearts a real edge with a penalty in the second minute. And a dam stolen! And it's 2 0! Jim, being a player, I've been a supporter, and you just need to ask how the supporters were feeling, and you'll know exactly how I was feeling because um, it just turned out to be the, the greatest day I've ever had in, in my life, and uh, it always will be because this time would be more special than any other time, and that's what I dreamed about because I felt that so long and all the heartache wouldn't it be nice the, the first manager to do it at that time would probably experience something that maybe another manager come in and maybe say if he wins a cup or even myself wins the next cup it won't be the same it won't be the same it's it's given a lot of people for the first time in their lives who actually believed that never in their lifetime hearts would win a cup never believed it that maybe their fathers or their grandfathers who'd went along and maybe seen them win it in 56 or the time before that but i'd never ever seen hearts win a cup i uh, had a couple of chances to, to got been let down so often the 86 scenario was uh, must have dug in deep. So I knew it was going to be special and uh, it was very, very uh, a great satisfaction to be the manager to do that. I don't think anybody will ever experience anything like that again. Well, it was absolutely fantastic, you know, when you consider that, I think it was only about 10 years since I was a manager of Muscle Athletic and Jim was a manager of Gala Fieridine. And uh, here we were 10 years, which is, you know, no that long really, uh, to be lifting the Scottish Cup against Rangers in Glasgow uh, was a, a great achievement, you know, a personal achievement for me as well, and obviously with for Jim as well, and uh, it was a great feeling, and you know, t to be able to, on the day, maybe out thinking, out manoeuvre, Walter Smith and Archie Knox, uh, for where we had came from, was an achievement that we're really proud of, I think. Oh, that was great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Nothing against the Ranger, but it was still great. <laughs> but uh, oh, you just you're just amazed at it sometimes. Kind of what happens? Oh, well, that was a, a great day. Yeah, <laughs> <the tears coming. laughs> That's when we all got drunk at night, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope we get another cup, eh? Yeah. Another drink. Yeah. We hope we get another cup. We we'll get uh -huh. another drink. <laughs> His efforts that season earned Jim the accolade manager of the year, a trophy he cherishes alongside his other successes. But having re-established hearts as a force to be reckoned with, what does the future hold for Jim Jeffries? Uh, there's more I want to achieve at hearts, first and foremost. And I would like, after all the years of waiting to win a trophy, I'd like to be a manager to, to get one so quickly again. And, and then you would really would be a sort of legend in manager terms to to hearts, and, and that's something I would like to do. Um, but I know that y you can, there's enough time to spend at a club, and but you need to do well at that club to get the opportunity to move on. But it wouldn't be the end of the world if I finished my career at Hearts. I believe the ambition can be met at Tyne Castle. It's not going to be met just because the backbone, the spine of the club, are heart supporters. What is going to lift us forward is the restructuring that's taken place, the reconstruction of the stadium, the fact that we now have 11,000 season ticket holders, uh, the fact that last season our um, average home gate was above 15,000. Football is, uh, is a business, it's got to be run as a business, and this place is now run as a business. But it's a business with an increasing income and an increasing turnover. And all of that is geared towards keeping hearts at the top of the Scottish football, the rightful place, and hopefully challenging in Europe on a regular basis. And for the reasons I've stated, Richard, I, I genuinely believe all of these things are achievable, hopefully every season. It's been a long time since they won the, the league. I think it's a lot more difficult to win the league for Rangers and Celtic, given the resources they have. 
So therefore, it would be an even greater achievement to do that. We showed it was possible last last season. It's very early in the season at the moment, but it uh, showed it could be done. And I think it would be a greater achievement if we managed to pull it off. And I've said before, when I've been set targets, I've managed to try and achieve them, and I'm going to be pulling out all the stops to try and get Hearts to win the Championship, because that will then really make you a legend in the Hearts supporters' eyes, and that will be a nice way to finish the career.